Good morning or afternoon, everyone. I'm Betsy Cooper. I'm the Executive Director of the Aspen Tech Policy Hub. For those of you who are new to us, we are a policy incubator training scientists and technologists on how to engage in the policy process. And I am thrilled to welcome you to our first demonstration day event of the third cohort of our full-time fellowship program. Our fellowship program welcomes 15 members in every cohort who spend 10 weeks with us full time to learn about policy impact and policy making, both inside and outside of government. This cohort started their time with us in September 2021 and ended their fellowship in late November, many of them having deferred over a year to join us due to COVID-19. Over the course of 10 weeks, our fellows spent time working on a policy project. They identified a tech policy problem they were passionate about solving, conducted research on it, mapped and talked to stakeholders, ideated on solutions, and developed products in aid of their solution. This cohort's projects span from solving issues related to contractor worker compensation in tech companies to strengthening student data privacy in public schools. Wish that could be you? We are currently recruiting for a climate cohort to train scientists and technologists how to engage in policy, so help us spread the word. Today, we present the first of these group's projects. Today's projects focus on improving health tech and health data privacy. Digital healthcare innovations have the potential to vastly improve care by reducing costs, expediting treatment, and personalizing medicine. At the same time, digital healthcare tools have also brought up critical governance issues related to health data privacy and algorithmic transparency. Today's projects answer the question, how can we promote the use of digital tools to improve healthcare while also preserving privacy and equality? Just some quick logistical notes on today's event. We first will be hearing from four fellows who will be presenting their three projects. Then we're thrilled to introduce, introduce former US CTO, Anish Chopra, who will give a keynote speech commenting on the three projects. We'll then open it up to Q&A for Anish and all of the fellows. Please use the Q&A box to submit your questions. In tandem, we'll be sharing links to our fellow products via the chat box. So please take a look there to see the amazing things that our fellows have built. Now I'll turn it over to our first fellow, Daniel Bardenstein, who will describe his project focused on strengthening medical device security. Daniel currently works on cybersecurity and technology policy at the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency in the US Department of Homeland Security. Previously, he was a product manager at the Defense Digital Service where he led cybersecurity projects. Thanks for being here, Daniel, over to you. Thanks so much, Betsy. Really excited to kick off this exciting session. So as I mentioned, uh, my name is Daniel Bardenstein. Currently, I am the tech strategy lead at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, also known as CISA. Um, but before my time in Aspen, uh, I led cybersecurity for Operation Warp Speed, uh, the US government's initiative behind the COVID-19 vaccines. And during that experience, I saw firsthand the frightening state of security across our healthcare system, particularly in smart or connected medical devices. So for my fellowship, I, with generous support from a fellow Aspen fellow, Ladrina Cherney, uh, focused on what policy levers government has to make medical devices more secure. So my ultimate proposal was that the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, who is responsible for regulating medical device cybersecurity, should require medical device manufacturers to do two specific things. The first, implement basic cyber protections across all of their devices, and second, make their devices easier to secure by hospitals and other device owners, such as patients. Taking a step back to look at the problem, recent studies estimate around 15 million connected devices in the US alone. That comes out to be around 20,000 medical devices per hospital. Uh, and this number is expected uh, to uh, proliferate and, and increase rapidly over the next decade. Uh, and medical connected medical devices are everywhere from patient monitors uh, in hospital beds to MRI machines, surgical robots, even our smartwatches. Uh, and in many cases, our lives literally depend on these connected devices. Um, and while beneficial, uh, a vast, uh, a surprising amount of these medical devices, as much as 50% of these devices are trivially easy to hack by a malicious hacker. So what does a cyber attack on a medical device really look like? Well, for the past decade, we actually have a number of examples of where security researchers, or AKA ethical hackers, have shown us what can potentially be done. Some ethical hackers have hacked into smart insulin pumps and have changed the dosage on those pumps to deliver a lethal dose to patients. This is all not actual patients, just uh, in, in uh, test environments. Uh, others have uh, 
hacked into X smart X-ray machines and have actually altered the results of the X-ray machines, either concealing what was a real tumor or creating the image of a tumor that didn't actually exist in the patient, or perhaps most uh, shocking of all, uh, being able to disrupt an implanted smart pacemaker that was actually in someone's body that could potentially cause uh, instant death. So at the end of the day, when we're talking about securing medical devices, we're really talking about sec securing patients and saving lives. So why are medical devices so insecure? Uh, as an analogy, let's consider your average car. Uh, when we go out to buy a car, regardless of the make and model, we assume that there are consistent safety features across the car, whether that's uh, seat belts or airbags or uh, automatic braking system. Um, that re again, regardless of you know, what you buy, they're gonna be there and they're gonna be implemented and roughly the same way. Uh, and secondly, if there's something wrong with the car, whether it's just a handy person or a mechanic can easily you know, go under the hood, take a look at what's going on and make repairs as necessary. The unfortunate uh, fact is that both of these critical features are largely absent in the current medical device uh, landscape. So the two policy solutions that I mentioned earlier address both of these head on. The first is that the FDA should develop a cyber baseline of mandatory protections for all medical devices. This is like having uh, the car's common safety features. And the second is that the FDA should require manufacturers to build a feature into their devices that I'm calling the device query interface that makes it easier for hospitals to secure their devices. And this is more like the ability to quote unquote, go under the hood and get a, a sense of whether the device is functioning well or secure. So let's dive into both of those uh, really quick. So on the cyber baseline, the last official guidance that the FDA has published for medical device cybersecurity was done in 2016. And there's another draft that wasn't finalized in 2018. So that's what all the medical device manufacturers are oriented towards now. That uh, slightly outdated advice contains non-binding recommendations uh, with a lot of ambiguity. Uh, it's kind of unclear to manufacturers what is actually required for their devices to get FDA approval. And so there's a lot of um, uncertainty and, and uh, the, the interpretation is up to the manufacturers in terms of which things do I actually need to implement into my medical devices and how do I implement those security features into those medical devices. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the manufacturers uh, and there's a lot of inconsistency in the final results. So what I've done uh, for this proposal is I've actually developed a baseline of cybersecurity protections that the FDA could actually include in their upcoming guidance that hopefully should come out this year uh, that has clear requirements, it has specific SWOR appropriate, so it makes it easier for everyone to align on the same standards, and it also involves new modern protections that were absent from previous uh, guidance from the FDA. Moving on to the device query interface. So again, we think about the ability to get under the hood of a car, figure out the, the health or status of a medical device or whether it's vulnerable to cyber attack. So traditionally, when this is done uh, in modern environments, in a, in a hospital setting, for example, uh, the way this is done is using tools that effectively blast a medical device with lots and lots of requests, um, asking about health status, are you vulnerable, what software is running, et cetera. And the way that these medical devices are built by manufacturers, they're very fragile. And so this amount of traffic can easily overwhelm medical devices and can essentially cause them to fail. And if there is a patient connected to that medical device on the other side, that can risk impacting that patient and their safety. And so for many hospitals to this day, they are unable to form this basic cybersecurity practice of being able to go under the hood, quote unquote, of their own medical devices to figure out which of them are insecure or which of them aren't working. So what the device query interface does is it's basically a feature that's very lightweight that manufacturers could build into their medical devices. And it basically reduces this risk. I like to think of it like a, a digital concierge in a hotel. Instead of, for example, if you needed to find out uh, where your friends or family were staying in a hotel, instead of having to knock on every single door, there's a concierge right up front, very easy, where you can ask a question and get back very quickly and answer. Um, and uh, by doing this, the, the device query interface minimizes the risk that the device actually malfunctions and causes a risk to the patient. So this would allow hospitals to have much better visibility into their medical devices, into the security and the vulnerability of those med medical devices and prevent potential cyber attacks. And now is a fantastic and urgent time for the FDA to act on this. Uh, first, like I mentioned, the FDA is actually working on updating new guidance that should come out later this year. 
Uh, and my hope is that uh, they consider these specific proposals and incorporate them into that guidance that will hopefully be published. Second, the more secure medical devices are, the more uh, cyber attacks we can successfully prevent or mitigate. And again, uh, hospitals uh, getting under attack can cause uh, delays in care, which can ultimately uh, result in patient death or other impacts to patient safety. Third, as medical devices continue to proliferate, uh, the FDA has an opportunity to really build and maintain patient trust uh, so that when patients or hospitals purchase medical devices, they know that they're not putting their lives at further risk in a different way based on the, the state of vulnerabilities um, and the state of security for in those medical devices that they buy. And lastly, and most critically, like I mentioned, say we save lives, right? Securing medical devices helps keep, keep patients safer at the end of the day. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation and I'll pass it back to you, Betsy. Thank you so much, Daniel, um, for showcasing your proposal to have the FDA require baseline cybersecurity standards for all devices. I especially appreciate this project, not just because I'm super passionate about cybersecurity too, but because as a result of COVID-19, we now know more than ever the importance of secure medical devices, and this project shows practical ways to build those. As a reminder, please use the Q&A function to ask any questions about Daniel's project, and please take a look at the links in the chat box to learn more. Next up, I'm thrilled to introduce Lucy He and Christine Kyung, who will be showcasing their project on using technology tools to expedite health insurance approval processes. Lucy is a software engineer, most recently at Flatiron Health, where she built technology to improve outcomes for cancer patients. Christine served as the city of San Jose's chief data officer during the COVID-19 pandemic, where she used data to enable equitable service delivery. We're delighted to have them both here. Uh, over to you, Lucy and Christine. Thank you for the introduction, Betsy. And we also want to thank fellow panelist, Matthew Zell, who also advised and contributed to our project. As Betsy mentioned, Lucy and I have a track record of building and implementing technology to improve bureaucratic yet essential processes in healthcare and government. We are so excited to apply our expertise towards the goal of improving medication access with better prior authorization in New York State. Our proposal for achieving this goal is to bring modern technology to the prior authorization process in order to get patients the care they need. Our proposal has two parts. First, require insurance companies to adopt technology to automate the prior authorization process. And second, ensure that the technology is easy to use and built with modern software standards. I'll start by telling you how prior authorization impacts patients today, and Lucy will take us through the details of these two parts of our proposal. Prior authorization is the process of getting insurance approval before physicians can start patients on a treatment. Anyone who has struggled with or have loved ones with chronic disease know how challenging this undertaking can be. Prior authorization helps insurance companies control costs, but can also harm patients by delaying access to care. These negative impacts are disproportionately felt by low income and minority communities who are more likely to suffer from conditions that require prior authorization. I know this from personal experience. Diabetes runs in my family. These are my dad and uncles, restaurant workers who work 12 hour days and who have each struggled with accessing essential care. While waiting for their prior authorization, they had to pay out of pocket for insulin, $150 a vial when they made less than $15 an hour. Patients like my dad with limited English language and digital literacy lack the voice and tools to advocate for the care they need. I'm that advocate for my family but the patients without that support system rely on their physicians. Physicians bear the burden of the prior authorization process. They are expected to navigate the complexities of each patient's benefits coverage, which requires them to spend hours on the phone with insurance companies. A 2020 American Medical Association survey quantified the extent of these costs. 94% of physicians said that the prior authorization process delayed care to their patients, and 21% of physicians noted that it led to avoidable hospitalizations. Physicians complete on average 40 prior authorizations a week for their patients, and the paperwork can take up to 20 hours hours. One reason why it takes so long is because different insurance companies have different processes that doctors must learn and follow. 
The current prior authorization process is death by a thousand paper cuts, but software tools can help. Modern software that provides patient prior authorization and health insurance information speeds up the physician prescribing process and helps patients get care faster. I will now pass it over to Lucy for a deep dive into our proposal on how to make this into a reality. Thanks, Christine. As you introduced, our proposal to improve access to medication relies on two parts. First, bringing tech to the PA process and improving that tech with software standards. I'll start by sharing more about the impact of using technology in the PA process. So first, when prescribing a medication, doctors traditionally may spend hours on the phone chasing down whether or not certain drugs require prior authorization. With software solutions, this information is available instantly. Software tools also can provide instant patient-specific insurance information. In contrast, when doctors check insurance requirements without software, they might only get information generic to certain insurance plans. Technology can also help doctors quickly identify alternative treatments to any drugs they're considering. And lastly, the right software user prescription time has been shown to help doctors avoid PAs altogether. However, through our research, we found that these benefits will not be realized until we improve software available today. This brings me to the second part of our proposal. Mandating physicians to use technology is ineffective if the tools are hard to use. And this is what physicians face today when trying to get instant patient-specific prior authorization information, which can involve different processes for different insurers. Therefore, regulators should improve technology by setting a single set of software standards for insurance companies to follow. So in the healthcare industry, interoperable software systems, meaning systems that all speak the same technical language, is key. You can think about how important it is to have a universal adapter for something like USBs. Setting a standard is the process of choosing one specific technical language for all software to adopt, similar to how Apple chose one type of USB for all of their laptops. And setting a standard presents two major wins. First, software will be easier to use as physicians will be able to learn and use a single rather than many prior authorization workflows when working with insurance companies. And second, the information provided by insurers will be accurate and actionable. This does, however, rely on regulators choosing a standard that has complete and rigorous information requirements. For example, one that requires prior auth information that's easy to interpret. Christine and I have identified such a standard authored by the standards development organization known as the National Council for Prescription Drug Programs. We've already drafted a regulation for New York State to adopt. Um, passing this regulation will unlock the benefits I previously shared. Doctors could get instant patient-specific prior authorization and insurance information, enabling timely care for their patients. They'd no longer have to spend hours on the phone and they could dramatically accelerate patients' access to medication. The time to make this change is now. Though we think all states should set the same software regulation, ours is specifically focused on New York State. There is New York State and federal momentum currently building to increase development of software tools targeted at reducing the harms of PA. It's important to pass our regulation in coordination with these federal and state efforts that are active now. And I wanna close by saying, to build confidence that the regulation will catalyze action, we've been working with a variety of industry, nonprofit, public and private stakeholders to get their sign off on a letter of support. We have heard over and over how important this is to do and to do now. We'd appreciate if you consider signing our letter, which you can find at tinyurl.com slash better PA. Thank you for your time today. Back to you, Betsy. Thank you so much to Lucy and Christine for showcasing their proposal for why states should mandate prior authorization processes using these new standards. What impressed me most about this project was how they were able to tackle a hugely complicated issue of health insurance processes and find a solution for it in just under six weeks. If you're interested in learning more, please use the chat box to learn more about this project. Uh, also, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, to ask them questions which we will get to at the end of the presentation. Next up, I'm thrilled to introduce Matthew Zhou, who will be showcasing his project on tools to help healthcare tech procurement officers better obtain products to minimize algorithmic bias and cybersecurity risk. Matt is a senior data engineer at Peloton, 
where he specializes in data governance and infrastructure. Previously, he was an engineering manager at Village MD and a data engineer at the New York Times. Uh, as a reminder, use your Q&A box to submit questions for Matt and any of our other speakers. Over to you, Matt. Thanks for handing over the floor, Betsy. Hi, everyone. My name is Matthew Zhao, and today I will be presenting our group's work in building a toolkit to help mitigate the risk of algorithmic bias in healthcare AI technology purchased by government organizations. Many thanks to Dylan Cruz, another Aspen Fellow, who helped support this project. I am excited to share the toolkit that we've built called Diagnosing Bias, which contains resources to help government procurement officers incorporate best practices on algorithmic accountability through these tools. These resources will help guide a procurement officer from the start of the process with educational resources to help them get up to speed on healthcare AI throughout the contract writing process for acquiring AI tools, all the way to the end of the process when they have to evaluate the selected technology vendors' AI products. Artificial intelligence in healthcare is having a moment. The coronavirus pandemic has highlighted the wide gaps and inefficiencies in healthcare access within America, as well as the vibrant opportunities that technology offers in solving those problems. Healthcare AI in particular has seen an explosion of venture capital interest in the past few years. A recent Deloitte report shows that venture capital funding in healthcare AI companies almost doubled from 2019 to 2020. It's clear that ample funding and smart talent are pouring into healthcare artificial intelligence, offering benefits like helping doctors make medical diagnoses, accelerating the development of new drugs, and being able to match patients to the right therapeutics and treatment plans for their illnesses. At the end of the day, what could be wrong with making healthcare more efficient and saving patient lives? It turns out that there can be some thorny problems that come with life-saving work. In 2019, a key study on healthcare AI algorithms published in Science Magazine found that algorithms impacting almost 200 million patients in America exhibited racial bias when recommending patients for additional follow-up medical care. About 28% of Black patients were overlooked for their medical needs compared to white patients with the same disease burden. This happened because the algorithm that recommended patients in this case assumed that the financial spend of a patient equated to the severity of their illnesses. Basically, the more you spent on healthcare in the past, the sicker the algorithm thought you were. This assumption missed the ways that marginalized communities have historically had less resources to pay for a doctor's visit, less access to health insurance, and in general, more reasons to distrust the medical system. The data held implicit biases from the past that were automated and baked into the algorithm, amplifying these biases to a population of millions. The unique risk in algorithmic bias comes from this way that it allows the systematic and repeatable automation of biases to impact people on a scale that was previously impossible. Assumptions are baked into the technology by the designers, and these assumptions should be tested to ensure that they aren't automating harm. Without good governance around the algorithms that make up recommendations on our behalf, we end up elevating computer code to public policy. We should all take an especially strong stance on how our government funds go towards the purchasing and deployment of healthcare AI tools for the common good. After interviewing procurement officers, technology experts, and AI think tanks, our group discovered some common underlying requests and pain points that began to emerge. First, we saw that procurement officers wanted standardization of AI contract requirements. They felt like they often had to reinvent the wheel when procuring AI tools, where they usually have little time to fully research the technology before having to draft proposal documents. There's a lot of ambiguity around vocabulary and really no centralized standards on AI best practices. The second request that came up was for a governance model around how procurement officers can monitor purchased AI tools over time, acknowledging the reality that these software products evolve over time as they get upgraded for performance improvements, as they apply security updates or add on new features. 
Some pain points that emerged were that procurement officers often had to contend with slow procurement processes that could take up to two to three years to actually purchase and deploy the AI technologies. Most procurement processes don't leave much room for quick iterative design that can acquire and evaluate emerging tech. The second pain point that emerged was that the process of defining the right performance metrics to evaluate the success or failure of AI products was often difficult and unclear. What did it mean for an AI model to have high accuracy? Does that mean that it's more often right than wrong? Or is it when an AI model is able to confidently identify when it's wrong? The idea of fairness metrics was also equally problematic with many slightly different flavors of what fairness really meant when it came down to questions of equality versus equity. Considering these requests and pain points, our solution is to offer AI contract writers through our procurement template generator tool, giving procurement officers ready-made templates for writing healthcare AI purchasing contracts. Government procurement processes commonly use request for proposal or RFP templates to be able to provide a foundation for organizations to define the goods that they need when soliciting contract bids from vendor companies. There are RFP templates for almost everything, for purchasing property, for cities to contract cleaning services, for schools to purchase IT systems. These templates help embed best practices, help standardize language, and set quality control requirements into the proposals by default. This template generator tool delivers procurement templates for AI technology, tailored specifically to the healthcare industry. With contract clauses that address transparency, bias mitigation, security, and privacy in healthcare contexts, in the same way that we, as individual consumers, might make purchasing decisions based on our values and beliefs, we should expect our government's policies and values to also be reflected in the ways that they purchase things as well. The goal is to make these templates open sourced and freely available to procurement officers in the same way that the technology open source community shares common software code to make technology accessible and higher quality for everyone. Our second solution is the AI model checklist. This resource offers a set of guiding questions and transparency artifacts that procurement officers can solicit from healthcare AI companies at each stage of the AI design process. The focus of this tool is to highlight the specific outputs that AI engineers can share to provide more transparency into their products for auditing. Tech companies have already started to express direct interest in the responsible design of technology tools with workers at large companies like Google and Meta calling out for better frameworks and building internal auditing processes for evaluating AI tools for harm and inequity. The public and private sectors should work together and align their accountability and transparency processes so that the internal work that tech companies are doing to promote responsible AI can really stand out to government, procure, government procurement officers when picking the best technology vendors. We are eager to continue refining these templates for AI procurement for more diverse healthcare use cases and to ultimately equip governments with the tools necessary to responsibly purchase AI technology. Thank you for your time and please reach out if you're a procurement officer interested in incorporating these templates into your purchasing process. Back to you, Betsy. Thanks so much to Matt for showcasing his request for proposal generator tool, which I guess is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, what I love most about Matt's project is how he was able to bring his technical expertise in software engineering to help government officials think about how to more ethically procure products. If you'd like to learn more about his project or see the RFP generator tool yourself, please check out the links in the chat. I'd also note that we really are going to be answering live questions, responding to one we've already received, so do submit them in the Q&A box. Um, I'd also like to let you know that a recording of this demo day will be made available after this event. So last, I'm thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker for today's event, Anish Chopra.
Anish is the president of Care Journey, an open data membership service building a trusted, transparent rating system for physicians, networks, facilities, and markets on the move to value. He's also the co-founder of Hunch Analytics, an investment hatchery focused on the use of open data to improve the health and well-being of our fellow citizens. Anish served as the first U.S. Chief Technology Officer under President Obama, and in 2014, authored Innovative State, How New Technologies Can Transform Government. I do have to say it's the only book both my husband and I have ever bought together, so, uh, so I'm very excited to have you here, Anish. Um, Anish will be commenting on the projects and also sharing a little bit more about why it's important to bring technical expertise to thorny health tech issues. Thank you so much for being here. Over to you, Anish. Well, I want to thank you. First of all, very kind to share um, that anecdote about you and your husband. I hope I hope it was a, a worthy read or a fun read. But uh, I am uh, thrilled to join you today and absolutely love all three projects and would love to see all three come to life and would love to share a bit more context about uh, the why and the how. Uh, what I thought I might do is maybe take a minute to sort of set the stage about where we are as a nation on, on healthcare writ large. And then a little bit about how the public private standardization process could use a little bit more love on the policy side and on activating uh, the private sector. So if you'll indulge, uh, I'll spend a couple minutes on, on each of these areas. And then we'll uh, speak uh, directly to the three projects that we've heard about. So uh, let me begin by the uh, sharing the theory of change. There has been a dream that our healthcare system can deliver better quality and lower cost, uh, all without slashing and burning rates or uh, you know, changing fundamentally the structure of the US healthcare delivery system, which for the most part is a marriage of public financing and private service delivery that if we could work within the boundaries of the current system, but maximize three very critical uh, uh, elements that are available today, but not widely used, we could get the system on a trajectory towards essentially a, a GDP plus zero uh, inflation rate uh, while boosting outcomes. This, uh, these three elements are about opening up uh, data held by the government or collecting new data in some cases. I loved some of the cybersecurity risk issues, which could be an area of new data collection. Uh, tweaking the payment models so that uh, we reward uh, the incorporation and use of said data to make care better. And then I love the prior off uh, project from the perspective of uh, really reducing burden on individuals getting access to the uh, uh, medications that they need, that we have a more personalized uh, navigation process that lowers uh, the, all the burden that we have put in front of people uh, as they navigate through the system. If we can do that, and we do so more of a bottom-up change model versus sort of a top-down prescription, uh, we could actually create a marketplace where people compete over helping uh, the system achieve its full potential. So given that, uh, let me just remind us that structurally, what makes uh, the three projects uh, come, come to life is that they really emphasize uh, the role of uh, public-private collaboration in an area that I refer to as handshakes and handoffs. When I say handshakes, what I mean is all three of the issues that you heard about are bipartisan. Both political parties want to see these problems addressed, and they're excited when there are entrepreneurial or innovative pathways to accomplish the mission objective. The handoff is the big divide. Today, the lack of standardization and the lack of templates or best practices in each of the domains we've identified, they uh, the lack of those uh, investments in standardization has meant that there really is no unifying approach. Uh, obviously, there are people who wake up in the morning and go to bed at night saying, I wish I made my medical device more secure. I don't want customers of my product to uh, potentially risk their lives. I certainly don't want my patients or my 
uh, beneficiaries for a health plan to go through mindless paperwork to get access to the life-saving medications that they need, nor do I want uh, biases in the way I allocate limited resources to uh, put one group over another because of I, my failure to understand uh, our process by which we allocate limited resources. Everybody wants to see these problems solved. The challenge, of course, is how. And my message to all three groups is to think about the elements of success. While we have regulation, uh, I view the regulation as sort of the second of a three-step process. The first step is achieving industry consensus. What would be a kind of an acceptable mechanism by which we standardize said processes? And that could be done with government encouragement, frankly, even some investment, uh, but it really does rely on industry consensus efforts, which then can be referenced in regulation, which is step two, which then results in a feedback loop on whether or not the regulations are working. And that feedback loop in many ways can uh, follow the first cycle, which is iterative and agile uh, changes. So uh, we referred to this as sort of public-private collaboration or open innovation, where the government would open up data, encourage industry consensus on standards, uh, hardwire the best practices through payment models. And it all, it all comes from the philosophy that encapsulated in, in Bill Joy, the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, Joy's Law, that said, no matter who you are, most of the smartest people uh, that work on the issues you care about uh, work for someone else. And so by having a more open philosophy to help bring about some of the standardization activity, it's an area that I think could be uh, uh, quite compelling. A little bit of an example of what the open world looks like. It's a decade in the making, but many of you might remember, it was illegal for CMS to disclose how much money individual doctors were paid in the Medicare program. That uh, changed in 2013. And by 2015, uh, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, you can look up any doctor in America and you can see exactly how much uh, they were paid. And who knew that the highest paid doctor in America was uh, from Medicare was paid $11 million because of a drug that he injects into the patient's eye. Now, uh, to the team that talked about prior authorization, interesting note, the medication that uh, Dr. Kunimoto would, would uh, you know, to st stall blindness uh, he mostly injected branded drugs that were between $2,500 and $3,500 in injection. And uh, the net, uh, NIH found that there was actually a, a $50 alternative, a compounded version of Avastin that would, have been, uh, that would have been clinically equivalent. Now imagine a poor Medicare patient that's res responsible for 20% coinsurance on that Part B drug uh, told that they have to inject this uh, medication to stop going blind, but not being told that there's a $50 alternative when otherwise it was $2,500 in injection. So this is an example where if that prior authorization uh, standard was in place and that real-time pricing and alternative options, then you would have seen uh, maybe some, some more uh, consumer empowerment. Similarly, while we don't have a national COVID vaccination standard, there was no top-down answer uh, we do have a sort of a FIRE API, which is a healthcare specific RESTful API standard or a framework. Uh, the community in the private sector rallied to develop what is essentially a QR code that could expose your vaccination status with your control and to release this data held by uh, the state of California and among, among others, uh, my home state of Virginia where the data is normally locked up in a, a kind of a health department database and is now accessible to any American through a third party app. So here's my, I'll end with these two very specific things that uh, I think is missing and areas where I would love to see each of these projects move forward. And that is a more explicit pillar of industry collaboration in each of these areas. So when we speak about a regulation for New York State that dictates that health plans have to standardize a plug for how uh, a doctor can uh, access and use uh, the, the, the kind of the medication choices for a patient, that uh, in and of itself doesn't result in success for individual families because it requires that that standard 
interconnects with all the other data standards that are out there. My advice and the thing that I spend my time on, on this issue of kind of price transparency, prior authorization, is that we build upon the Cures Act, which created a bunch of technical uh, requirements for doctors, hospitals, and health plans that are all now in production thanks to a variety of rules and regulations such that a consumer facing app or a physician facing app could connect to a health plan's uh, uh, kind of fire endpoint and to conduct a number of transactions. And so the key thing to me is, can we standardize an industry approach to use the existing Cures Act regulated fire APIs to answer the question of a doctor or a patient, do I need a prior authorization? What information do you need to know? And here's the resulting answer that you can consume and uh, render a decision, preferably in an automated fashion. MacGyver could work together on prototyping such a standard while uh, state and local governments and federal governments actually in this matter can, can formalize and scale up these resulting outputs uh, through regulation. Ditto on the device query interface, which I love that name, uh, same basic principle. So there's a separate regulation at the FDA around data transparency. And if you look at the data transparency requirements combined with your security uh, best practices, that common device uh, query interface could be both a mixture of controls. How do I actually track what is happening in the network so I can adjust, monitor, manage security features, as well as extract the data uh, for reuse and I think if you think of these as a kind of coming into together in conjunction, we can make a lot of progress. Last but not least, and I'll leave it here for the q and I loved the idea that we need to have more uh, of a procurement template or an AI you know, kind of checklist. Uh, I do believe that transformation for the healthcare system uh, will progress at the pace of trust. Now, in the Obama administration, we tried to create this baseline privacy framework and consumer internet privacy bill of rights. But the framework, while it didn't move forward in Congress, uh, does offer a similar analogy for what we can do for an AI algorithmic bias mitigation sort of framework. And it relies on, again, industry consensus that can be then regulated uh, either through the Federal Trade Commission for saying you promise you're going to do something in a uh, you know, you're, you're going to you're going to monitor your your AI uh, uh, outputs to to look for evidence of bias. Fail is declaring that you will do this and then lying to your customers because you didn't actually do it would be a, a, an FTC violation. So putting a lot of that procurement RFP template in the framework of a consumer commitment that these things will be done might give us a regulatory hook above and beyond the best practice sharing on the RFP. So Godspeed to the three teams. I'm excited about all three. and would love to volunteer to help uh, close some of these loops in terms of engaging in more public-private uh, collaboration around the design. But otherwise, I'm grateful for the chance to share a few words and excited to take any questions and participate in the dialogue. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anish, for your kind words on all these projects. And I was particularly delighted to hear you make the point that these are bipartisan issues and everyone should get behind getting them done. Uh, for the fellows, also, you have a wonderful advocate here willing to help you. So I hope you'll take him up on that. Um, now I want to bring back all of our speakers from today's event for an open Q&A session. As a reminder, please use the Q&A box to ask any questions. While we're bringing up the other speakers, let me turn my first question to Anish. So Anish, what do you see are the biggest opportunities for tech to improve healthcare challenges and what are the biggest risks in your mind? Well, I've felt that the biggest opportunity for a while in tech is what I refer to as a health information fiduciary. So if you take all of these issues, right now, uh, we are. if I went on Google and I'm like, who's the best doctor in New York for X? I get some general understanding about, you know, Yelp reviews that were involved or some other relatively lightweight mechanism, but there's so much more information that's available that in the hands of a, the supercomputer in my pocket, I could conceivably make a much more data-driven decision to find the right doctor for me, to choose the right health plan, 
to determine whether or not I need to get care in an urgent setting, go to the ER, think about alternatives, uh, maybe even a telemedicine consult. So every step of the healthcare journey for a, a family, if we tapped all of the already available open and regulated data sockets, put them into a kind of a computing environment, and there were a marketplace of applications fighting over each other to interpret that information to help my loved ones make better decisions, I think that's got the most potential. And I say that because we see high variability in healthcare. There are communities in America where people navigate effectively through the system. They find the right doctor, they join the right network, they're in the right plan, and they get incredible care. And the same person in a different market may end up with a completely different experience, more unnecessary visits to the ER and hospitalizations and so forth. So really it's about finding best practice and GPS routing people through the system with all the publicly available information. That's what I'm hoping. And if there's anyone launching a company like this, I'd love to be a seed investor, friend, ally, you name it. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, next, I'm gonna to turn to Daniel. Um, a question from the audience, what considerations are being made for regulating safety standards in the context of global supply chains? That is components manufactured outside of US jurisdiction. Uh, great question. So uh, this is actually something that <clears throat> uh, from my research, um, the FDA has been thinking about for a number of years. And I think it's, it's only gonna uh, become stronger which is the, the concept uh, of the what they call the S bomb, the, the software bill of materials. So the in the uh, FDA space for the last couple of years, they've referred to it as the C bomb, the cybersecurity bill of materials, um, which is not a, a silver bullet by any means, but is one mechanism. It essentially lists when you when you buy a widget, a software hardware widget, it lists kind of all of the the parts, so to speak, digital parts that are in that widget and where they came from, and you know, so it's easier to kind of keep track and under understand all the different. Uh, companies and hands that this that played a role in, in creating this thing. So uh, again, C bomb or S bomb isn't going to necessarily save all supply chain from security threats, but I, I think it's definitely a step in the right direction because, as we saw with the vaccine, it, there's just so many moving parts, literally, and there's so many companies from around the world, um, and it's it's not an easy problem. So I think there's a lot of technology moving that direction. FDA has been there and is continuing to move there. Um, and I, I will encourage and support anything they continue to do for that. Fantastic, thanks so much, Daniel. Um, next, I'd like to turn to Lucy and Christine. Um, so two questions for you. First, um, are you considering other strategies to implement this prior authorization project in states other than New York? So maybe Lucy, I'll ask you that one. Yeah, thanks for the great question. Um, so. Definitely, we think in other states, the approach will be similar, so through regulation. Um, and what we've been excited to do is kind of follow the trends in different states and see where it makes sense to do this first. In New York, there's been great precedent set by different initiatives that already existed. Um, there's one project known as the Shiny that's promoting interoperable information systems in our state. Um, and also, um, as mentioned in our presentation, there's like this legislation that pairs really well with res this regulation that we're trying to move forward. Um, and it's really in other states waiting for the same climate. So seeing what's happening in that state and then timing the regulation um, along with similar efforts. Fantastic, glad to hear that answer. Um, Christine, um, does your tool, um, your prior authorization tool work for Medicare patients as well as private insurer patients? Does it work equally well for both types? If not, is there a way to make uh, transparent any outcome performance differences that might occur? Yeah, so the short answer is yes. And I think one of the reasons why, um, you know, I think Lucy and I chose to center the presentation on, you know, real family, my family is, I think oftentimes when it comes, you know, when, when it comes to building tools around healthcare costs, it's really important to, you know, solve for, you know, the most vulnerable communities, right? Or, you know, what you could call the lowest common denominator. Like we are not, you know, so much of kind of the burden of PA and kind of the costs of this process, it disproportionately impacts minority and low income communities. And so, you know, as we were designing this, right, and we actually chose regulation as a way of ensuring the equitable implementation, uh, you know, of this, of the software standards and the tools, like we focus on families, the most vulnerable families who are on Medicare and Medicaid. Fantastic. And next I'd like to turn to Matt. 
Um, what was it like thinking through algorithmic account, blah, 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 sorry, I'll try that again. Algorithmic accountability for healthcare AI compared to how you might think of the same issue for AI in other sectors. What considerations came up that are specific to the healthcare industry and patient data? Love this question. Um, yeah, I think in general, algorithmic bias has a lot of common patterns that generalize across industries. A lot of times it's a resource allocation issue or it's um, reflecting on how vulnerable communities have traditionally not had access. Um, but I think healthcare in particular has had policy and regulations that have really shaped the, oper the operationalization of how uh, some people who are developing healthcare AI are able to go about that process. So when it comes to how fragmented healthcare data is, between different silos and the need for an interoperability standard that Anish mentioned, uh, that feels pretty unique to healthcare. And it affects how people purchase these things because you're having to live with that reality. Uh, I think the stakes are so high in healthcare data that between you know, different countries like the European Union, between America, there have been special provisions for protecting the privacy of health data in particular. And they're often classified healthcare data is often classified as the highest risk when it comes to algorithmic accountability. So I think there's a lot of high stakes uh, involved within that development. And so people have to be really careful and kind of as Anish said, healthcare adoption proceeds at the pace of trust for these kinds of things. Fantastic, uh, we'll do another round Robin. So Anish, uh, you mentioned public-private partnerships. So what do you think is the best approach to those public-private sector collaborations in the healthcare tech space? What do you think governments in the private sector can do to make those collaborations happen more effectively? Yeah, so I, I love it when there is a call to action by the government to say, we're looking to standardize around this issue. We want the private sector to self-organize and then come back to us with an approach. So if I can give you a case example, we, uh, it's always been a, a, a kind of a legal truth in HIPAA that the consumer has the right to their health records. And the reality of sorts is that it's not as easy as it seems. So the Obama administration said, we would love to put out a requirement that uh, patients with mobile phones should be able to access their medical records on these devices. Now it gave you a little bit more technical uh, kind of detail and said, can you guys figure out a specific way to, to organize uh, this uh, requirement into production? So it doesn't matter whether that's EHR company one, two, three, four, or five, there should be a simple protocol for an app developer to say, get medications list, and it should respond with the results. When the government did this, it resulted in the uh, community coming together around the Argonaut project, which is sort of a small, loose consortium of volunteers. And after industry testing and collaboration, Apple Health, as we now famously know, was able to launch uh, with nothing but this open industry standard as the fuel to bring data into the uh, device. That then resulted in the government saying, oh, there's enough evidence of industry adoption to regulate on the back end. So there's been like three turns of that wheel, a call to action, industry self-organizing, and then scaling through regulation. And I think all three of these projects will have that same, uh, it may not be at the same four or five year time cycle, it could compress a little bit, but it'll have the same cadence. Fantastic, that's really helpful. Uh, Daniel, how long do you think it'll be before we see the first ransom tart or the first wormable Bluetooth based ransomware? And what will this be what it takes in order to create actionable change in how medical device manufacturers approach securing the internet of the body? Uh, I love that that name. I love that question. So, just a quick background for for everyone else. So, um, uh, the question was around ransomware for Bluetooth, right? If I if I understand it correctly, yeah. So, ransom so for, for yeah, ransomed organs, essentially. Ransomed organs, yes. So, when we think about uh, like implanted devices, like an implantable pacemaker that uses Bluetooth. So, for most folks who are familiar with Bluetooth devices. The, the limiting feature, but also good security features that it only you can only get access to them from about 20 to 30 feet of range. So in order for a rant, uh, some sort of worm that could jump from Bluetooth to Bluetooth or kind of hack medic implanted devices at scale, you'd have to be very close to a lot of devices or they'd all have to be very close together um, or there's some other things. I, long story short, I think we're far away from that. I, I think if somebody really tried, they could create some, I won't go into the specifics, um, 
But I, I think like any good uh, security approach that we should think about what the worst case scenario could be uh, and, for, and make sure that we are uh, accounting for that in our strategy and our defenses, um, because it's, it's where you least expect it, where somebody finds a creative way to do something you never thought they would do before. So my, my, it seems like the ransomware operators are making plenty of money just ransoming most general IT devices and banks and computers. So until we stop that problem, I don't think they're going to move over to, to people quite yet. Let's hope. Fantastic. And a very quick question for Lucy and Christine. Can you tell us more about who you will talk to or how you're aiming to get your tool into regulation or policy? Thanks. Um, so we, or, we were only able to quickly cover in our last slide, we do have a full advocacy plan for getting our regulation in the right hands. And so we've already been chatting with private, public, industry stakeholders, some who are very connected with the Department of Health. We've already chatted with someone there and are just hoping to get it to the final person to, to get the okay. Yeah, and actually just a quick plug again for our call to action. Um, if you're interested in signing on to the letter or learning uh, more about you know, how we want to make this into reality, please visit tinyurl.com slash better PA. Fantastic, great plug. Um, so I'm going to turn to my final question for the um, group here. So I'll start with Matt. Matt, what is your bumper sticker takeaway uh, from this uh, session? What is one really brief, really pithy takeaway from your work? I would probably say that responsible healthcare AI requires both public and private partners to be aligned and talking the same language. Great. Christine? The current prior authorization process delays patient access to care, but software tools can help and setting the right software standards will allow technology to improve patient access to medication. It's a pretty long bumper sticker, but I'll give it to you. Lucy? Plus one to Christine's the same. <laughs> Daniel? Secure medical devices save lives. There's a bumper sticker. Anish, what about you? <laughs> Uh, harnessing the entrepreneurial spirit of the country to solve healthcare's challenges. That's a beautiful note on which to end. With that, I'd like to close up this morning's event. Thank you so much to the fellows and to Anish for joining us and showcasing these projects. Congratulations, fellows. You're officially done. I also want to take a moment to thank the funders that make our fellowship program possible. These include the Craig Newmark Philanthropies, the Hewlett Foundation, Omidyar Networks, Ford Foundation, and Schmidt Features. I also want to thank our phenomenal team that made this happen. Let me tell you, these projects do not look as pretty when they uh, come to us, and our amazing team makes this uh, happen. So that includes our project manager, Meha Aluwalia, our program assistant, Maeve Snedden, and deputy director, Mai Sisla. If you'd like to have the opportunity to do projects such as these, please check out our climate cohort application, open for scientists and technologists interested in using policy to help prevent climate change, open for applications now. And we're also hiring a policy fellow, an experienced policy professional to help us support our trainee. Check out the links in the chat. And last, I want to invite you all to join us in two weeks for the second of our four demo days from this cohort. This demo day will be focused on empowering marginalized workers and voters. The projects will focus on solutions to decrease the pay gap between contractors and full-time employees at tech companies, ways to ensure that workers have a say in key startup decisions, and new tech frameworks that can be used to improve the turnout of overseas voters. If you're interested in attending, please check out the chat bot to register for the event. We hope to see you there. Thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.